Thank you very much, John. I'm looking at this picture here of Dr. Kleine, uh, and it's the picture that appeared in an ancient edition of a Westminster catalogue. Uh, I'm sitting in Ireland in the early 1970s with a copy of a Westminster catalogue, reading it assiduously and thinking, boy, I would love to be a student at Westminster Seminary. And, and what was it's so intriguing to me at that time were, was the names of the faculty here. Edmund Prosper Kleine. Can you imagine it? Richard Birch Gaffin. Sounded so exotic. Um, John Micklefatrick Frame sounded quite normal to me, uh, but uh, all these wonderful, wonderful names. And then to actually come here and meet these people. Before I ever came here, let me tell you a story. The year is 1977. The city is Belfast in Northern Ireland. It's a very dark and difficult period in the history of Northern Ireland as the IRA pursues its armed struggle in pursuit of its political aims. <clears throat> there are regular bombings and shootings in the city. There are armed soldiers and armored vehicles on every street corner. On this particular evening, there's a large congregation gathered in one of the main halls in the city center. They are there to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And one of the denomination's founders is a man called James Greer. He had been a student at Princeton in the days of Machen. And Mr. Greer is chairing the meeting. The preacher that evening is Dr. Edmund Kleine, president of Westminster Theological Seminary. The platform is huge, large enough to hold a full orchestra and a choir on bank seating going right up to the great organ pipes at the back. And there are just two rows of seats behind the lectern where the ministers and the senior elders of the church are seated. Everyone is eager to hear this celebrated and special speaker. Dr. Kleine announces his reading from John chapter four and dives into an arresting and illuminating exegesis of that text as Jesus explains to the woman at the well how that the coming of Messiah the argument over the proper geographical venue for worship is now totally redundant. And as he begins to develop his theme, a door opens high up at the back of the stage and a man appears moving rather hesitantly, tiptoeing along the back of the stage and every eye in the congregation is now following this figure and the congregation is no longer enthralled by Dr. Kleine's careful exegesis. The man moves slowly down the steps until he comes to the second row of the men sitting behind the speaker. He whispers to the man who's seated at the outside of the row and he passes him a note. And the note moves along the row until it reaches the man sitting directly behind Mr. Greer. He then leans forward, whispers into Mr. Greer's ear, and gives him the note. All the while, Dr. Kleine is preaching his text, and perhaps he's wondering why his congregation is not quite as focused on what he's saying um, at that particular point. Mr. Greer, now an elderly man, rises to his feet, stands behind Dr. Kleine. Dr. Kleine is unaware he's there, and he's waiting for him to pause, and it seems like an eternity, even though it only lasted a few seconds. As Dr. Kleine pauses for breath, Mr. Greer puts his hand gently on his shoulder and interrupts him. He steps forward to the microphone with the announcement, a car is illegally parked in Frederick Street, and if the owner doesn't remove it immediately, the army will carry out a controlled explosion. From the second row of the congregation, a small white-haired man gets up 
and sheepish, sheepishly makes his way down the center aisle. And now it's back to Dr. Kleine. And his careful explanation of the significance of Mount Gerizim. Could he ever pick it up again? That was my first experience of hearing Edmund Clowney preach. We could say it was a preacher's nightmare. How do you deal with that kind of interruption? But I heard enough that evening to convince me that if I were ever to learn how to handle and preach God's word effectively and accurately, I needed to understand the Bible better. 16 months later, I came here and registered as a student at Westminster Seminary. What Dr. Kleine illustrated that evening was really the great theme of his preaching ministry and the main characteristic of the wonderful contribution that he made to the development of biblical and redemptive historical preaching in the evangelical and reformed church. It was the way in which he established and described the link between biblical theology and preaching. And by placing the story of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well in its wider biblical context and within the unfolding drama of redemptive history, the whole passage came alive. Many tributes have been paid to the ministry of Edmund Clowney. He made a significant impact on the revival of biblical theology and preaching that can't be assessed by his writings alone. I've already quoted this uh, this morning. Uh, Brian Chappell wrote that wonderful endorsement for one of Kleine's books. He was the generation's patriarch of redemptive historical preaching. For decades, he was the voice crying in the wilderness to encourage evangelical preachers to make Christ the focus of all their messages, since he is the aim of all the scriptures. Now many others have joined Kleine's gospel chorus, but none with greater mastery than he of the harmonies that weave the symphony of grace throughout the Bible. Tim Keller said, Ed Clowney taught me to preach the gospel to postmodern people. To anyone who wants to learn to do so well, these sermons are priceless. He was referring to Clowney's book, Preaching Christ in All the Scriptures. That's his legacy. And that's why we considered it appropriate that we remember him and reflect on his contribution in the area of preaching and the communication of the gospel. It's appropriate that he joins the list of those whom we consider to be great preachers. John Frame said, nobody had a deeper understanding of how all scripture witnesses to Christ. He influenced a generation of preachers to apply evangelical biblical theology to its preaching, treating the whole of the Bible as a narrative that finds its meaning in Jesus. I think I quoted Harvey Conn already today. No one who studied under Ed Clowney from 52 to 84 ever missed that commitment. He brought to every course biblical insights shaped by his studies in the history of special revelation. Whether in homiletics or Christian education, missions or ecclesiology, every cl class, each class moved from Genesis to Revelation, drawing together the whole of Scripture with new insights that pointed in a fresh way to Christ and his redemptive purposes. And then what our friend Bill Edgar says, Kleine's book on preaching and biblical theology revolutionized the way preachers presented Christ in their sermons, avoiding both moralism and lifeless doctrinal preaching. Edmund Clowney was born in Philadelphia on the 30th of July, 1917, into a Presbyterian family. When I talked to him about his full name, Edmund Prosper Clowney, he was very quick to remind me that his mother's maiden name had been Moore. He had strong Ulster Scots, what you folks call Scotch-Irish connections in his lineage. He received a BA from Wheaton College in 1939, a THB from Westminster here in 1942, an STM from Yale University Divinity School in 1944, 
and a DD from Wheaton College in 1966. He was a pastor and an educator. It was after pastoring churches in Connecticut, Illinois, and New Jersey that he came here to Westminster Seminary to teach practical theology and then served as president from 1966 to 1984. Clowney influenced many preachers who trained here at Westminster. And his influence has extended way beyond the seminary to the wider evangelical constituency and particularly to reformed biblical theologians. Where did Clowney get this insight into the connection between biblical theology on the one hand and preaching on the other? Well, he sets that out in the little book that's over in the book store right now with the clear title, Preaching and Biblical Theology. And in the preface to that book, Clowney states that his writing, writing came out of the conviction that the biblical theological approach of the seminary classroom was excitingly rich for the pulpit ministry. The biblical theological tradition that he's referring to is the approach of Gerhardus Voss, whom he cites and quotes throughout the book. Clowney builds a case for the implementation of Voss's biblical theology into the preparation of sermons. Towards the end of the book, he gives some very clear practical advice on sermon preparation. Attention to sermon structure is important, he says, to convey with simplicity the richness of biblical theology. However, most of the book is devoted to the theological foundations underlying a biblical theological homiletic. Chapter one's entitled, What is Biblical Theology? And it's really a summary of the arguments of Gerhardus Voss in his work on biblical theology. Uh, the discipline of biblical theology had been defined in a variety of ways, but Clowney follows the definition offered by Voss. That branch of evangelical theology, sorry, I'm behind on my slides here. Let me see. Too far. Uh, that branch of exegetical theology which deals with the process of the self-revelation of God deposited in the Bible. He argues that the preacher must accept the unity of the scripture in order to have a truly biblical theology. And in making his case, Clowney writes, if we're to have a genuine biblical theology, however, we must accept biblical presuppositions uh, and reject the anti-supernaturalism that is so often assumed to be inherent in the historical method. Uh, Clowney was advocating this approach at a time when mainstream scholarship was embracing other alternatives to Voss and evangelical theology. In the second chapter, uh, Biblical Theology and the Authority of Preaching, Clowney calls for a complete rejection of the distinction between kerygma and didache, at least in the way in which it had been proposed by Bultmann and C.H. Dodd. Uh, according to Clowney, the end result of Bultmann and Dodd's theology is a shift of authority from the text to the church. He writes the insistence on the revelation of God, uh, of the revelation in Christ, a sheer event is really only a denial of the revelation in word which Jesus himself professed to give. He, he believed that the consequences of this denial is that authority is stripped from the words of scripture and almost inevitably decisive authority is assigned to the church. Instead of Bultmann's demythologizing and Dodd's charismatic theology, Clowney proposed a theology of verbal inspiration. For a genuine renewal of authority in preaching, the biblical theology of verbal revelation must be studied. Event and word are not to be separated, certainly not to be pitted against one another. Instead, events as recorded in the Bible are to be understood as historical. Uh, like many groundbreaking books, Clowney's preaching and biblical theology is not comprehensive. 
it's been said it's more a manifesto than a manual. He didn't emphasize a rigid methodology for showing how the entire scripture bears witness to Christ, but he kept insisting and showing that it did. Consequently, when as preachers we read Kleine, we're convinced of what we should do, we might also be frustrated as to how we might do it. It's taken a second generation of writers and preachers to give us some guidance on the practicalities of sermon preaching and sermon preparation in the Kleine tradition. Uh, one of the big themes with Kleine was this desire to bridge the gap that often exists between the study and the pulpit. He noted that while biblical theology movement was often cultivated by theological liberals, the concept of biblical theology is hollow and empty without an inspired, infallible, unified revelation from God. He regarded the that the authority underlying faithful biblical theological preaching is the word of God written. Uh, Martin Woodstra notes that Kleine was contending against the notion of God's word as deed rather than as objective communication of content. And Kleine denounced any suggestion that charismatic proclamation itself possessed an authority greater than the content of the proclamation of scripture. He said the amazing chain of reasoning that argues from the scriptural premise that the word of God is efficacious and active to the contradictory conclusion that it is an act rather than a word has no support whatever in the Bible. The theory of preaching based upon it is equally contradictory. So Kleine asserted that the preacher is bound to the word of God written because in our hands, he says, we hold the inspired kerygma and didache of the witnesses who testify of Christ. His approach was built on the foundation that scripture represents God's own infallible commentary on his deeds. Uh, in discussing biblical theology and preaching, Kleine highlights a couple of other important points with regard to preaching. He says, we have to take account of the eschatological situation of the act of preaching, which is simply to say the, the recognition of the time in which we preach. We preach in the last days. We preach in the age of fulfillment. We preach in the time of the coming of the kingdom with power, the already not yet of the eschatological kingdom of Christ. And according to Kleine, preaching that has lost urgency and passion reveals a loss of the eschatological perspective of the New Testament. Don't ever preach without that urgency, without that passion, uh, without that energy that is needed in order to understand the times in which we preach. Kleine also asserts that the preacher must know the place in which we preach. He calls for recognition of a biblical text's place in redemptive history and an understanding that the whole world then is the place in which the gospel must be preached. Uh, that gladdens my global ministry heart. According to Kleine, it's biblical theology that aids the preacher in understanding that preaching is both kerygma and didache and must take place in the church and the world. So Kleine reminds us, God didn't give us a Bible in the form of a textbook but that the revelation unfolds in progressive epochs in the history of redemption. The epochs of revelation are connected by an organic unity that runs through redemptive history and that centers on Jesus Christ. Therefore, biblically faithful expository preaching has one essential message, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, Kleine notes, there are many who would agree with the assertion that all preaching must be Christ-centered. Yet even where this principle has long been acknowledged, the practice of preaching often falls short of this ideal. The brand of preaching which Kleine recommends rejects simplistic moralizing. Recognizes that, recognizes that there's no antithesis between redemptive historical preaching and preaching on the ethical imperatives of the scripture. Kleine argues that the redemptive historical approach necessarily yields ethical application, which is an essential part of the preaching of the word. 
And in closing that, that volume, Crowney argues that biblical theology is the key to new richness in sermon content. He affirms that he's not advocating a particular mode of sermon preparation, but rather highlighting an essential component of biblical interpretation as such. And that component has two steps. First, to interpret the text in its immediate context and historical period. And second, to interpret the text in the biblical theological context of the entire canon of scripture. Clowney emphasizes, it must be stressed that this second step is valid and fruitful only when it does come second. In other words, every biblical passage must be interpreted in its textual horizon, its epochal horizon, its canonical horizon. Thus, he, he warns about the danger of attempting to apply biblical text without understanding the text in its own biblical theological context. In addition, the preacher may exploit symbolism from the entire canon to deepen his sermons, since biblical symbolism is not an accidental literary feature, but rather a unifying structural element. Symbols abound in scripture, he says, not incidentally, but because of the structure of the history of redemption, which is at once organic and progressive. Further, Clowney explains the relationship of symbolism to typology. He writes, symbolism involves a vertical reference to reveal truth as it's manifested in a particular horizon of redemptive history. Typology is then the prospective reference to the same truth as it's manifested in the period of eschatological realization. Now, these connections, these relationships are explained further and developed in the famous Kleine Square. Uh, he diagrams, um, well, began as the Kleine Triangle, um, not the Kleine Square. Let me tell you the story. Uh, if we represent the history of redemption by the horizontal line leading to Christ, we may assume that all the truths of God's revelation are fulfilled in Christ. An Old Testament event or ceremony, a prophetic priestly or royal action may therefore symbolize pointing to a revealed truth at a particular point in the history of redemption, truth to the first power, T1. We can be sure that this truth will be carried forward to Jesus Christ, truth to the nth power, TN. Here in Christ is that truth in all its fullness. So we may therefore connect the event, the ceremony, the action directly with that truth as it comes to full expression in Jesus Christ. This line is the hypotenuse of the triangle it forms. It is the line of typology. If the symbolism of an Old Testament um, incident or person is not perceived or does not exist, no line of typology can be drawn. But the diagram may be enhanced by showing that the truth in Christ applies to the present hearers of the message. Uh, our colleague Vern Poitras has suggested that instead of us thinking about that line of significance in two dimensions, we should think of it coming out of the page <coughs> directly toward us as the hearers. And that's a very helpful and creative insight. So when Dr. Clowney was teaching this material here at Westminster in the late 1970s, <coughs> Rich Craven and I were classmates together and we were talking together and reflecting on what had been taught and Rich was smart and thoughtful and uh, feisty enough to suggest to Dr. Clowney that his triangle might be improved by adding two other lines into the diagram. So the, um, the Clowney triangle really became the Craven Square um, and he added the, the other two lines um, and he, the lines of moralism uh, and allegory. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kleine includes that conversation and those discussions with Rich in his subsequent description of the development of the square. If we bring down the line of significance directly from the Old Testament revealed truth to us with no reference to the fulfillment of the truth in Christ, then it's moralism. It presents a truth apart from the history of redemption and therefore apart from the cross 
the resurrection, the ascension, and the lordship of Christ. It unconsciously assumes that we can go back to the Father apart from the Son. Uh, moralism, as you know, has been the bane of much preaching in the past, still occurs regularly in some pulpits. It's been the time-honored way to tell Sunday school stories. Don't be afraid of the big giants in your life. Be brave like David. And it fails to see David as the Lord's anointed, who is a type of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who meets and conquers Satan, the strong man, so that he may deliver those who are Satan's captives. Allegory is also inadequate as a way to explain scripture. He says that the preacher who relies on allegory will try to explain a text by picking something in it, giving it an interpretation that's unrelated to the context or the meaning. And he suggests that a preacher might take, for example, reference to a lamp in the room provided for Elisha by the Shunammite woman as referring to the prophet's need for light and then to make all sorts of applications for a thematic message that runs from Genesis to Revelation on the need for spiritual light. Pliny's point is that the unfolding of redemption and of revelation constantly binds together the words and deeds of the Lord. The Old Testament follows God's one great plan for human history and redemption. And that plan is not only from him, but centers on him and his presence in his incarnate son. The history of redemption and of revelation exists because of Christ's coming. Had Jesus Christ not been chosen in God's eternal plan, there would have been no human history at all. Adam and Eve would have fallen dead at the foot of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The grace of God's covenant promise is the source and heart of redemptive history. Let me uh, turn then briefly to another aspect of Edmund Clowney's understanding of preaching, which makes him so noteworthy as a preacher and which is of particular interest to us as we think about this interface between preaching and apologetics. That aspect is Clowney's understanding of the role of apologetics in preaching and his appreciation for the work of Cornelius Van Til. He describes his understanding of the importance of Van Tillian apologetics for preaching in the Van Til lecture in 1983, subsequently published as an article in the Westminster Theological Journal. And the main point which Clowney makes is that if we're going to understand Van Til, we must appreciate that Van Til is first and foremost a preacher, not a philosopher. In the lead article of the Jerusalem and Athens, a book prepared uh, to celebrate Van Til's 75th birthday, Van Til offers his credo. He says that he writes for his friends and Christian critics so that we may be of help to one another as together we present the name of Jesus as the only name given under heaven by which men must be saved. And it's that commitment which controls Van Til's life, teaching, and work in the area of apologetics. Van Til looks back to his early days in the Netherlands, and he records that every minister in those days had a VDM degree, verbum, verbum di minister. When, therefore, I became a teacher of apologetics, he said, it was natural for me to think not only of my THM and my PhD, but above all, of my VDM. The former degrees were but means whereby I might be true to the latter degree. And looking back on 40 years of teaching, he would be known as Cornelius Van Til VDM, a preacher of the word of God. He says, the self-attesting Christ of scripture has always been my starting point for everything I have said. And in his credo, Van Til describes his own development in very clear terms. Beginning as he did with the self-attesting Christ of Scripture, he was also reformed in theology, for reformed theology focuses on the Christ of Scripture. It confesses his lordship in salvation and in revelation. Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bavink 
taught Hym Van Til that the idea of scripture must never be separated from its message. An inadequate view of God's sovereign grace leads to an inadequate view of God's sovereign word. And then the Holy Spirit and the word of God do not change men. Men must first agree to be changed. Reformed theology denies all autonomy of man in relation to God or the word of God. It begins in subjection to the authority of the word of God. God speaks in Christ and we must hear. If Reformed theology begins with the self-attesting Christ of Scripture, Reformed apologetics should do the same thing. So Van Til's critique of traditional apologetic, even amongst Reformed apologists, is that it has failed to do so. Instead, it has admitted the very view of human autonomy that is rejected by the theology it seeks to defend. Van Til then, says Clowney, is not simply a philosopher with a heart for preaching, Indeed, he's not merely a theologian with a heart for preaching. He is a preacher, concerned to begin where a preacher begins, with the authority of God's own revelation, and to do what a preacher does, confront unbelief and nourish faith with, thus saith the Lord. In all his apologetic labors, he continually stands with the apostle on Mars Hill, not debating the probability of God's existence, but proclaiming the creator God, who holds all men accountable before the judgment of the risen Christ. So Van Til's apologetic is the consistent outworking of the stance of the Reformed preacher. The preacher proclaims the word of the Lord in a world where Christ is Lord. And the implications of this are not new or novel for Reformed preachers, but Clowney shows how Van Til has deepened our understanding of them. Preaching must be God-centered, he says. God-centered preaching will be Christ-centered, and such preaching will be rich in applied content. And Clowney makes the point, given the form and content of the Bible, how can preaching be anything else other than God-centered? In the beginning, God does not introduce a book that features heroes of the absurd, wizards of technology, or politicians of progress. The Bible is not only from God, it is about God. From start to finish, the Bible tells us of the works of the Lord to the glory of the name of the Lord. The advice given to preachers today is that they should seek to be relational, seek to be relevant. The important relationships are those with our spouses, our children, our work colleagues, our neighbors. Relevance means that preachers address and support the goals and the aspirations of their listeners by telling them how to manage their time or their investments or their work-life balance. For Clowney and for Van Til, the problem with that approach to preaching is the starting point. We cannot begin with our own needs and our own situation and then try to bring God into the picture. Preaching, says Clowney, cannot be God-centered in the second place. Rather, preachers, he says, emerge from the throne room of heaven with the chorus of the angels ringing in their ears. And as he preaches, he stands before the throne of God, even as he stands before the worshiping assembly of God's people. We do not merely preach to the women and men before us in the congregation. We praise and we worship God in our preaching. We lift up the name of the Lord in our preaching. And our preaching moves from exhortation to doxology. This is how the apostle describes his own gospel ministry. It's an offering of praise that causes the Gentiles to sing hymns of worship to the Lord. And the God of the Bible is the sovereign Lord and Savior of his people. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of him and through him and therefore unto him and all the glory and praise belong to him. That's why preaching should be God-centered and God-glorifying. But preaching that is God-centered will also be Christ-centered. How does God save? How is his salvation accomplished? God comes to save in the person of Christ, Emmanuel, 
He is Christ the Lord. And both Clowney and Van Til take their cue from the biblical theology of Gerhardus Voss. They understand, as we have pointed out, the progressive nature of the history of redemption and how the war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent lies behind all biblical history. And this history of redemption finds its focus and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. As Peter tells us concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. So preaching should seek to bring every thought into captivity to Christ and to show how Christ, the living word, speaks to us today. The Bible is not a dead book that it should be viewed as being in contrast to the living Lord. The book is living and active because it contains the words of Christ given to him by the Father. They are spirit and they are life. And thirdly, both Clowney and Van Til emphasize the fullness of revelation in the scriptures. Preaching can be rich in its application because God speaks to us as creator and as redeemer. Van Til emphasized God's general revelation as well as his special revelation. Clowney says that means we see all things in the light of God's word. But we must understand the world of our hearers, the context into which the whole counsel of God must be preached. Our world is exceedingly complex. Preachers need much wisdom as they speak, speak to people who live and struggle with major ethical issues in politics, biological research, medical procedures, environmental stewardship. We dare not address these issues. We dare not pontificate on them from the pulpit in an unthoughtful way, proclaiming what uh, Kearney calls proclaiming amateurish notions or prejudices under the mantle of divine truth. And that's why places like Westminster Seminary have traditionally required a college or a university degree prior to the study of theology. Ministers of the gospel need the knowledge, the critical thinking skills to understand their culture as well as being experts in the Bible that they seek to proclaim. Clowney lamented the near collapse of liberal arts education. One of Van Til's disappointments was what he considered to be the failure of the Christian university movement. The vision of educating young people and preachers so that they can apply a Christian world and life view to all the contemporary issues remains a challenge for us today. We must call on men and women, girls and boys to serve the Lord in every area of their lives, said Clowney. They must do so knowing that the battle for truth and holiness goes on in the whole of human culture and the whole of history. So we remember Edmund Clowney as a great preacher. I've got to finish. There's a rich resource of recordings of his preaching. 144 of his sermons are available on sermon audio. So you want to be able to preach like Ed Clowney. It's unlikely that any of us will ever be able to emulate him in his preaching. He was uniquely powerful, a uniquely attractive preacher. But if we want to learn from him so that our preaching will be enhanced, then I've simply two pieces of counsel to offer to you. Number one, read your Bible. What made Clowney's preaching so engaging was his thoughtfulness about the details of the text of scripture and the connections he was able to make between various epochs of redemptive history. That was possible only because he was immersed in the Bible. And we can do no better than that. We need to take time to read and meditate on the word. It seems strange that we preachers should need to be encouraged to do that. But we can be so easily distracted 
by other pastoral duties, that we don't give adequate time and effort to that basic means of grace, this fundamental Christian discipline. Read your Bible. And then secondly, love Jesus. Make Christ first and foremost in your affections. See him clearly. Consider him in all his perfections, his majesty and his glory. Meditate much on the person and work of our crucified, risen and exalted Savior. Come again in love and worship to Jesus, our Redeemer, our King and our Lord. Let me conclude with this quote from Pliny. Yes, to Jesus we come. For with richness of vigorative language, wealth of ethical insight, and depth of redemptive historical grasp, we are brought by the scriptures to Jesus. God, who spoke in diverse manners, has spoken in his son. What focus is brought to our preaching in this approach? When we hear the cry, lift up your heads, O ye gates, we see David again dancing before the ark in the ascent to Jerusalem. But we're borne along by the unity of Scripture to see more, to see the king entering in triumph. Not only that earthly Zion where the children sang Hosea, but also ascending to the heavenly Jerusalem where the eternal gates lift up their heads to the king of glory. Here, says Kleine, is freedom in preaching coupled with faithfulness to the word of God. Here too is a message which comes with freshness from that word which liveth and abideth and reaches men's hearts with relevancy and power. It involves patient and faithful study. It's not a superficial technique, but a lifetime direction. Amen.